Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's Firelight Chat. Uh, I have an important guest today. Uh, this issue of climate change and saving the planet is certainly on everybody's mind. One of the things I talk about a lot is that every time I talk to an audience, I say, is anybody here either a young person who has said, or are you an older person who has heard a young person say that under normal circumstances you would consider perhaps having a child? But that given the state of the planet, you don't think it would be the responsible thing to do. And it is heartbreaking how many people raise their hands. And I always ask people to keep your hands up so that everybody can look around. And I find it's even more now than it was when I ran for president last time. It's up to like a quarter of the people in the room. So obviously we have a, an entirely young generation who is very hip to what's happening and is not living in denial. Um, we have a president who has acknowledged that uh, climate change is the um, you know, single largest existential threat. And to be honest, um, with all due respect, this is a playbook that we've heard now, you know, when certain, particularly corporatist Democrats, say the right thing, but it's what they do that we have to look at. The truth of the matter is that the president has given more oil drilling permits even than Donald Trump did. And of course, now we know that he has approved the Willow Project. So, you know, they like to brag about the fact that they did some healthy green investment, and they did do some healthy green investments in the Inflation Reduction Act. But that $8 billion ConocoPhillips uh, oil extraction project uh, up in the North Slopes of Alaska will completely nullify all of that investment, plus the president um, uh, has also approved of the exportation of liquefied natural gas. This is one of the main differences I have with the president. One of the first things I would do, like day one in the Oval Office, is I would cancel the Willow Project. I do not believe that the kind of incremental changes in climate change and saving the planet that the Biden administration represents is going to be enough. And um, I've said here before, uh, I I'm not afraid in 2024 uh, of Donald Trump. I'm afraid of people staying home, and uh, that's what I think is going to happen if the Democrats continue to uh, be so hypocritical in terms of what we're actually doing to save the planet. One of many reasons why I think that my candidacy and this campaign is the way to go. Um, I am using the Firelight Chats to give people an example. Um, who do I listen to? Who do I take seriously? Who would be my counselors and my advisors as president? And tonight is certainly a perfect example of that. Um, Peter Kalmus is with us tonight. Peter Kalmus is a friend and a colleague, and let me uh, give you a little bit of his bio so that you can know that uh, there's no slouch with us here today. Peter Kalmus is a climate scientist, currently mainly studying extreme heat and dying ecosystems. He has a bachelor's degree in physics from Harvard University and a PhD in physics from Columbia University. He is so concerned about where society and the planet are heading that he's been arrested twice for nonviolent civil disobedience, once protesting the funding of new fossil fuel projects, which flies directly in the face of the science, and once protesting how rich people still fly in private jets, which shows how our society still doesn't take this seriously at all. He is the most followed climate scientist on Twitter. You can follow him at, at Climate Human, plus his website is Peter Kalmus, K A L M U S dot net. And his book is Being the Change, Live Well, and Spark a Climate Revolution. Okay, here we are. Peter Kalmus, thank you so much for being with me. Yeah, thanks for chatting with me. It's a pleasure. You know, Peter, you're one of the people who I think took me up a notch in terms of my panic and hysteria. <laughs> and, and I say that as a compliment. Um, you are not content to just say the facts, obviously. BA from Harvard, uh, PhD in civics uh, from Columbia, you know those scientific facts, but you come at all this with such a passion and such a kind of Paul Revere type of warning. Tell us where we are now. And uh, I want us to have a conversation uh, today about where it is we need to go. Yeah, so we're in uh, entering into the summer of 2023. We are seeing absolutely crazy wildfire smoke from absolutely crazy uh, fires all across Canada, Canada, which have been touched off by drought and by extreme, like unseasonally hot temperatures due to climate change. Uh, we're seeing heat waves all through the south, which are unprecedented. We're seeing, you know, um, uh, Antarctic ice at record lows. It looks like it's kind of 
sort of going off the charts, not acting like it has in previous years. Uh, same, same thing with uh, sea surface temperatures and various parts of the ocean. Um, this is looking to me like uh, an especially crazy summer. Um, I don't, I don't feel like, I feel like we have maybe been, I mean, I would say as a climate scientist, I've been feeling terrified for a very long time. Uh, uh, even before I was a climate scientist, I was basically terrified by where we're heading because of the inaction of society. But there's something that feels different about 2023, um, something that feels like we don't understand this Earth system as well as we thought. And we're starting to pound through some of these tipping points that we've been talking about for a very long time and maybe somehow like been talking about it in a way too much so that people have gotten they've kind of tuned it out and now it's happening um i was at a uh, a scientific conference a few weeks ago and i was uh, talking to one of the scientists on the planet who I respect the most. He's a tropical forest expert. And he said that he feels that the Amazon rainforest has already passed the tipping point, which means um, in his sense is that there's nothing we can do at this point to save the Amazon rainforest, which is one of the incredible things about planet Earth, right? I mean, um, I don't know if there's other rainforests in the universe, but this is certainly the only one we know of, and we're losing it on our watch. And that is something that I find completely unacceptable and terrifying and sad, and it strikes me with grief. And I am furious at President Biden, his administration, and the Democrats right now. Um, he's going around crowing that he's a climate champion. You cannot be a climate champion. You cannot be even claim that you're taking action on climate change if you're still expanding fossil fuels, which is what he's doing at every turn. Like, it's hard to imagine any president expanding fossil fuels faster than the Biden administration is. Um, so I feel, I just feel helpless as a scientist. I feel like I'm not being listened to. I feel like um, I've got two young children who are teenagers now and I'm terrified for their future. I'm terrified for the future of young people. And um, yeah, I feel like my back's against the wall. And uh, I, you know, we can talk about more details, but I'll, um, that's, that's how I generally feel right now. It's not, uh, things are not good right now. Okay. So first of all, let's talk about the Amazon <clears throat> and then let's talk about President Biden's climate agenda. So first of <clears throat> all, for people to really have an understanding, this is a huge area of the planet, mainly in Brazil, correct? How many square <clears throat> miles is the Amazon rainforest? Oh, I don't know. It's huge. I mean, you look at the globe, right? And it's like the kind of the biggest part of the South American continent. But I don't know how I don't know how many square miles. I should I should say that this is not my area of particular expertise. Right. I'm I'm Yeah, but I mean core, we're, talking core about, core we're talking about bigger than some countries. Yeah. Okay. So Oh absolutely think... bigger bigger than some countries, yeah. yeah. And it's just one example of what we're losing too. I, I want to emphasize that. Like I my own research suggests that we will not have coral reefs on planet Earth by mid-century, and I think the, we're going to start seeing absolutely insane devastation of coral reefs uh, well before mid-century. So it's just, yeah. I want to drill <laughs> down a little more on the specifics because some of the the main facts have been said over and over again. People know we're losing the coral reefs, but I, I want to drill down into yeah. what that really means. So I have heard the Amazon uh, rainforest as described as the lungs of the planet. So first of all, tell people why we need, not just why we should enjoy, not just why we should appreciate. Why do we need the Amazon rainforest in terms of its ecological significance to the rest of the planet and to us as a species? Why do we need the Amazon rainforest? Yeah, that's an interesting question. A lot of scientists, a lot of policymakers uh, frame this in terms of what they call ecosystem services, where they try to put a dollar sign in terms of what these ecosystems mean to people. Um, so for coral reefs, you have fisheries, for example, and you have protection from uh, uh, tropical storms. Um, with the Amazon, so it does, uh, you know, um, kind of help the planet breathe in some sense. I don't believe that if we, when we, well, I guess I should say when we lose the Amazon, um, that we're going to suddenly suffocate. Um, my own framing has a lot to do with ethics and morals and love, actually. Okay. Um, you'll, you'll be maybe surprised to hear a scientist say that um, because it's, it's just one of the most 
obviously biodiversity rich areas on the whole planet. There are so many amazing species, so many uh, birds that don't live anywhere else and mammals and plants and insects. It is just a uh, literally a glorious, wonderful part of the planet. And we're losing it now. Um, and then, of course, there are the people who live there who depend on those ecosystem services. But in my mind, it's it's almost like a cosmic thing to lose the Amazon. And it just, um, it breaks my heart. And I do, I actually have to say, I find it hard to put into words, to put into dollar signs, just what that means to me. Um, one of the things I appreciate about mm -hmm. your book is that it is very spiritual. You do talk about these things in the context of our moral responsibility to the planet, to ourselves, and to our children. Now, it's interesting because you've mentioned the Amazon, you've mentioned the coral reefs. You said something a couple of minutes ago that the coral reefs actually have an ecological function of of breaking some of the uh, the strength of tropical form of storms before they reach land. Is that correct? Yes. Also, mangrove forests are, uh, play that role as well. Would you tell lands. people? Tell people. Tell us where these coral uh, these coral reefs are. So they are in uh, the the warm parts of the planet's oceans. So um, mostly in the tropics. But you have them all throughout the world in that band of the tropics around the planet. So of course, you got the Great Australia. Barrier Reef off of Australia. You've got the Coral Sea around um, Indonesia, uh, north of Australia. Um, you've got uh, corals off the coast of Africa, off the coast of South America, and all the islands of the Pacific and the Caribbean and Florida. So yeah, all throughout that tropical band. Well, you're talking about things like losing the Amazon, losing the coral reefs and all of those things, yeah. which are extremely significant. Now talk to us about the weather. Well, yeah, so I am uh, one of the things that terrifies. Me. So we, we have to get to the, the policies. I, I mean, like not just uh, terrifying people more. I think the people listening to this already get that. But, no, I, you know, I will say that still, one. If I may say so, no, I think we all need to understand because all of us need to be mm -hmm. need to be ambassadors of the message. And so we can't just we're still panic. We have to express information. Yeah. So where do you see the weather and so, where is it that you fear it's going? Yeah, collectively, I will say that as a society, we are still in denial. Um, I believe that the vast majority of humans do not actually understand how much danger we in uh, we are in right now, and that sometimes being afraid is a is a rational response to danger, and that's what our brains are wired by being basically afraid to move ourselves out of danger, which is what we have to do now as a species. Yeah. So yes, no, I, um, I, I want. To, we need to move from fear to oh, moral outrage to activism. I think everybody understands that, certainly. And that's yeah. really the, the, the point of my running, certainly the point of this campaign, certainly the point of your work. But yeah. what I'm asking uh, more, more is specifics. Yeah. What are the weather uh, phenomena that you're most concerned about? So, so yeah, extreme, extreme heat is probably the weather pheno phenomenon that I'm most concerned with. Um, so uh, as hot as 2023 summer is going to be, um, it will be on average the coolest summer for the rest of all of our lives which uh it should really be terrifying like the, one one way i think about this is uh the earth system has you, you can think of a giant control board with like thousands of lights and and dials that are kind of monitoring the state of the earth system you've got the you know atlantic um overturning circulation you've got uh, biodiversity you've got mean uh, ocean temperature you've got mean surface air temperature etc 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 thousands of these things and right now now they're all trending in one direction, right? You've got ice melting, you've got sea Greater levels heat. rising, you've got species moving towards the poles, you've got heat waves getting worse. Um, every single one of those uh, Earth system diagnostics should be flat. Like it gets noise, it goes up and down from year over year, but over many years, it should on average be flat. That's a healthy, balanced planet. Right now, these things are all going crazy trends in one direction. And that's why I can say with complete confidence that this will be the coolest summer for the rest of our lives. And people need to understand trends, right? So it's not like we've gotten into climate change now, isn't that too bad? It's like, Every year we let either a Democrat or a Republican expand fossil fuels, it gets hotter and all these impacts get worse. Okay, so we're talking about heat getting hotter and hotter and hotter. We're talking about the fact right. that if this trend continues and you're suggesting that we should 
expected it will, uh, entire swaths of continents, and this is the thing, everyone, entire swaths of continents could become so hot that they are uninhabitable. So what you then That's have right. is you have an implosion of ecosystem, implosion of food supply, implosion of economy, right. and that creates climate refugees, what could be hundreds of millions of climate refugees. So, you know, we we're always hearing about what's happening at the southern border uh, in the United States. We hear about all these uh, immigrants who are on boats, sometimes dying in the Mediterranean Sea, trying to uh, find a place to live. So imagine that multiplied with hundreds of millions of climate refugees. The planet and our civilization, world yeah. civilization, will not be able uh, to absorb this. Okay, so you're talking about greater heat and you're talking about the ice melting, which rise, so sea levels rising, which means we lose some of our cities and so forth. Okay, so I think you're right. I yeah. think people are getting a picture of what the disaster possibilities are. So now let's talk about policy. So you and I agree that we don't need to be ramping up fossil fuel extraction. We need to be ramping down fossil fuel extraction. And you and I are both appalled. And one of the reasons I'm running, quite frankly, is that this president is actually ramping it up. We need a mass mobilization. We need to mass mobilize in order to achieve a just transition from a dirty economy to a clean economy. And this incremental approach to doing so, this purse thief approach, which is, oh, we're so responsible towards the planet over here while over there we're doing terrible things, is, uh, is unacceptable. And, you know, Peter, I want to say something a little bit before we go into how we're going to achieve uh, that transition from a dirty economy to a clean economy. Um, one of my friends, uh, someone that you and I both know, uh, was talking to some uh, environmental and, and climate uh, organizations, asking them if they would have a Zoom call with me. And uh, a few of them were saying, oh, um, we're going with Biden. And he said, how could you go with Biden, giving, given what Biden is doing to, to actually support fossil fuel extraction? And all of them gave him the response, what else do we have? Now, first of all, everyone, I'd like to say a little bit, hello, I'm here. There's this invisibilization of the campaign, this, this sense of erasure. What you have is someone running for president who is saying that on number one, on day number one, I would cancel the Willow Project, and yes, the president has the power to do that. And we are Americans. We have been taught not only to limit our imag political imaginations about what to expect, as American citizens and what we deserve as American citizens, namely all the things we talk about that are granted to every other, uh, the citizens of every other advanced democracy, such as universal health care, tuition-free college, and so forth. But also, we have been trained to expect too little from ourselves. We're Americans. We can do this. When people say, ah, oh, you can't do it, you can't make the transition, absolutely we can make the transition. And I want to give you an example. I want to tell you a story. When Hitler started marching on Europe, the United States didn't have any army. Britain didn't have any army. We had nothing. Hitler had been, uh, had been working for five years to build up his military. And every time he went into a country and, and invaded that country and conquered that country, he was able to absorb their industrial capacity. We had nothing compared to that. But what did Roosevelt know? Well, too bad, we have to make it happen. And we were Americans. Our ancestors were Americans, and they made it happen. We have been trained to, to acquiesce. We have been trained to forget. We can do this. And that's one of the reasons I want to ask Peter how. So Peter, talk to me. We're going to make this transition. We're going to, we're going to make the transition, wind, solar, all the things you're going to tell us about. Tell us how we're going to ramp down okay. uh, fossil fuel extraction. <laughs> how we're going to ramp up a green energy grid. How are we going to do it? How fast is it going to happen? And what do we do to, need to do to make it happen? Right. So keep in mind that I'm a climate scientist, uh, so I'm not a policy expert, but I have a lot of opinions. So um, even before we get into that, I want to um, kind of take kind of step back and kind of talk about big pictures. So first of all, so remember, I'm uh, trained as a physicist. That's how I started out. You can't fool physics. <laughs> this is about molecules of gases in the atmosphere that interact with infrared photons that can't stream to space like they 
would otherwise be doing. So the planet heats up, you get more of those photons, get an energy balance at a hotter planet. That's where we're heading. I don't think we're going to, there's no way we can stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius anymore. Um, I will be thrilled if we stay below two, but I think two is going to be absolutely catastrophic, much worse than most people think. Like, like look at 2023. I think we're already seeing uh, kind of a new a qualitatively new kind of global heating, it feels like to me. Um, if we stay on this track, um, and that's where we are now with the Biden administration, I believe that we do put billions of lives at risk. I also want to say that this yes. damage to the Earth system. Hold on a moment, please. You just okay. said that with the current Biden agenda, you just said mm -hmm. that we are putting billions of lives at risk. That's Let my feeling, you. yes. When you and those like you say that to people in that administration, what is their response? I've never gotten a response from the Biden administration. I have no idea if they know who I am. I do not feel listened to. That's why I've started doing civil disobedience, which probably makes them ignore me more. But at least it tends to look. I've tried so many ways to warn the, the public and to warn the policymakers Nothing I've done has worked at all, except for civil disobedience, which has worked a little bit. So when I've gotten arrested, at least so that gets somewhat noticed. It went viral on social media. What is your impression of these environmental organizations, such as those I mentioned that say, what else do we have? What are they doing? What I feel like they are they are cowardly. I feel like this is how we lose the planet. It doesn't matter whether a Republican or a Democratic president yeah, yeah, it doesn't. It cares about the CO two molecules. So if if you've got a Democratic president expanding drilling, uh, approving new liquid natural gas and oil pipelines, uh, new projects, um, the opposite of what all the sci climate scientists say we need to do, which, like you said, is ramp down fossil fuels. It doesn't matter that that he's a Democrat. It's still going to make the planet get hotter. And then, yeah, I I think this year, like it, it will take. If we get to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we'll peak a, a little. If if we were on that track, which I don't believe we can be at now, we would have peaked a little bit before the end of the century, and we would have started coming down around then. Two degrees Celsius, we're going to have a hotter planet for a long time. We go past two degrees Celsius right now. Uh, most, I think, the consensus is on, that we're on track for at least three degrees Celsius of global heating. We could have a hot planet for hundreds or thousands of years, and then all the other impacts could last even longer than that. Biodiversity loss is the longest time scale that could last for millions of years. So in the fossil record, when we've had previous mass extinctions, it lasts for about 10 million years before biodiversity recovers on planet Earth. These are the stakes. And yet we have Washington where they just keep kicking the can down. They do not seem to understand what the stakes are. And it kills me as a scientist, <laughs> especially when they say, say things like, oh yeah, I'm a, like Biden claiming he's a climate champion, saying that he listens to the scientists. So I'm done being polite. I feel like my kids' lives are at risk. <laughs> so I don't know what to do. Like, I know like this is not a socially acceptable way for a scientist to talk, but I am freaking desperate here. So, so yes, you're, you're, you're absolutely right that the whole thing, like I, the, Everything we need to do goes under this umbrella of a World War II scale mobilization. We need to understand this is an emergency. I think we need to enter what I call emergency mode as a society, and the U.S. should be leading the way. And it's great if the U.S. leads the way on this. That's great for the long-term health of the U.S., right? We should be a leader on the most important uh, challenge facing humanity, right? We can't let, we can't allow other countries to get ahead of us on that, which is what's happening, right? So, so yeah, so once you understand that this should be kind of top priority for humanity right now and for the U.S., then the other policies start to follow. And that's what we can start talking about in some detail now. So everybody, I want to a little bit about the campaign. You know, sometimes when you uh, look at a campaign like mine and you say, well, this is really good because you're contributing to the conversation. We don't have time. We don't have time to just contribute to the conversation. This is about electing, whether it's me or anyone else, it's just that I'm the one who's saying this, who's going to go in there and, as Peter said, declare an emergency. And that means you have the power uh, to actually make some of the changes that the system as it now exists, particularly given the unbelievable financial 
uh, power of big oil is just institutionally resistant to. That's why billionaires are literally working on spaceships so that they can leave the planet because some of the people in the uh, in this country who are the most in the know know this is going to be an uninhabitable planet. And I, if we're not, if we do not make these changes, we're six inches from the cliff, but we're not there yet. We're at the eleventh hour, but it's not midnight yet. You know, I just always, Peter, when the, these conversations happen, I just have to take a moment and grieve what it means that Al Gore did not become president in the year 2000. And particularly everyone, let's be very clear, when they talk about the steel stealing the presidency, the election that was stolen was Al Gore because Florida was not allowed to count its, its votes. The, uh, you know, the Constitution says that the states are in charge of their votes. The, the um, Supreme Court of the United States came in and stopped the voting in, Calif uh, in um, uh, Florida. I remember my daughter was a little girl. She was in the back seat. I heard on the radio that the, that the Supreme Court of Florida said we're going to count every vote. I pulled into a driveway. I was practically crying, and I started explaining to my little girl. She was, at the time, only 10 years old. Honey, this is why America is great. This is why America is great. They're going to count every vote. And then the Supreme Court came in, and Sandra Day O'Connor, who is now a retired justice, said later she regretted that vote. We were hoping she'd be with us. They said that they, this could be a hardship to, uh, to George Bush. It could be a hardship to him to count the votes. They did not let that stand. Later, the votes were counted. Al Gore basically won that election. And we would have had a world-class uh, yeah. environmentalist, someone who was sounding the alarm. He would have been president in 2000, and we would not be dealing with this horror today. I just, it just, it bears noting. And because I'm old enough to remember that, uh, it's a story that should never be forgotten. It's a great story. Good to remember that. I, I would say also that um, systematically, you, you could even take a step back and look at the fossil fuel industry, which has been blocked, doing everything it can to block climate action for at least 30 years, probably more like 40 years. And not out, well not out of ignorance either. Not out of ignorance. Not out of ignorance. So they, they've known. <laughs> they, it's crazy. It's just insane. They, they've literally known. And in 2021, uh, four oil major CEOs actually went before Congress and they were asked point blank if they would stop disinforming the public, if they would stop funding the American Petroleum Institute, if they would stop lobbying to block climate action. All four of them said no, that they would keep doing this disinformation. They, they wouldn't even accept that. So they're, they're, they've been dishonest for decades and they're committed to staying dishonest. It's just, it, it boggles the mind. So they, they were, uh, they, you know, they didn't come out and say, no, you know how they do it. They, they kind of, um, they blather for some time, right? But they don't say that, that when they're asked point blank, that will you stop, you know, funding disinformation? They will not say, yes, I will stop funding disinformation. It's insane. We are, this is how we lose a planet. I don't, yeah, I don't know what else to say or do anymore. I want everybody to know who's yeah. listening that you make me president. I'm not going to be nice, nice. You know, these are not, this is not personal. Some of these people I'm sure are nice people to have dinner with. But um, the, these are institutional forces that are, as Peter says, destroying this planet. And this is not about um, trying to see both sides. There's no other side to the murder of the planet. So I'm president. We're in the Oval Office. I say, Peter, come to Washington. We need to talk. And I'm going to ask you to be on a commission and to help us. And we're going to we're going to plan out how we are going to make the change uh, from a dirty economy to a clean economy. You want to tell us some things about how? I know you said you're not a policy expert, but you certainly have some ideas. Okay. Well, so. Um uh, we, I, I think you've already talked about this, but we certainly have to figure out a way to end this corporate lobbying in Washington. Uh, so, for example, the Mountain Valley Pipeline was approved by Chuck Schumer and Joe Manchin. They have both literally been taking money from that corporation that, that wants that pipeline. So that's that's bribery, plain and simple. And again, that's how we lose the planet. Hold on. just want to reiterate guys, because there's so much here that we need to not only hear, we need to really take it in. What Peter was just saying was the Mountain Valley Pipeline, that money was given to Joe Manchin, I mean, donating to campaigns, obviously, and to Chuck Schumer. And what Peter just said is something that I say often, our Congress has become a system of legalized bribery. Mm -hmm, exactly. And of course, and similarly, we about a lot of this as well. 
Right. We also need uh, some way to help hold media uh, corporations accountable when they spread lies. So if, if, a, if a corporation like Fox News says climate change is a hoax, if it spreads disinformation, um, they need to somehow be held accountable for that because we need public support to, to get all of the other policies. Then, so once we have those two things in place, we can actually start to make some changes, right? And so the global heating emergency is caused by roughly 75 or 80 percent fossil fuels. So we have to ramp that down. No amount of carbon capture and storage, no amount of planting trees, uh, no amount of solar panels, et cetera. It's, it won't matter if we don't ramp down fossil fuels, right? Because that's the main cause. And the secondary cause is animal agriculture. That's roughly 15%. So we're going to have to ramp yeah, that down too. Animal, and that's animal. one that I, yeah, I, f I feel like there's a huge cultural you, divide there. And um, yeah. If you look at, at Marianne2024.com, everyone look at the issue section. You will read not only about ramping down fossil fuels, but also something Peter just said that we must end animal agriculture factory, uh, animal factory farming and by the way it's so immoral it is so cruel even if it wasn't destroying the planet Agreed. it should not exist all right go on peter yeah and how how we do that without you know um declaring an emergency causing a huge well i anyway i just culturally I, I think there's a lot of people that are still like you know um you know and factory farmed ultra cheap meat like over my dead body right like i'd rather have the planet burn than not have the super cheap meat in the grocery store so i'm not sure how we convince everyone that that's what we need to do but the thing is if we could chop out that 15% of global heating from animal agriculture, we could basically do that uh, very, very quickly overnight. Um, and that would, that would huge, that would buy us so much time. Nobody would die if we ended animal agriculture, right? We would need, like I saw on your, on your website too, like you talk about how we have to uh, make sure people who are working in these two industries are able to get new jobs elsewhere. So we would have to take care of them. Um, but there's a lot of other things, the, the 75, 80% from fossil fuels, that is harder to phase out. Right. Some of that. So what Peter is referring to here, everyone, is important. And that's you. I'm sure you've heard me talk about we need to make a just transition. That's a phrase people use. It's very important. A just transition from a, a dirty economy to a clean economy. What that refers to is the many thousands of people who make a living, who make a living it directly or indirectly in jobs that are associated with fossil fuel extraction or animal factory farming. So, for instance, I've had people say to me, wait a minute, I make over $100,000 a year working for the uh, fossil fuel company, and you're telling me I'm supposed to go make $15 an hour uh, putting up solar panels? Well, the answer is, exactly as Peter was just saying, there should be a just transition. These people are making a lateral move in terms of their economic circumstances and they're working for the green economy should absolutely be guaranteed by the government and under my administration they would be. These people would not just fall through the cracks. Remember, a lot of these jobs, whether it has to do with technology, manufacturing, delivery, research, they are, they can be repurposed because there's a lot of technology, there's a lot of manufacturing, there's a lot of research, there's a lot of, uh, of, of business opportunity that is necessary in the development and the quick ramping up of a green economy. There are plenty of jobs to be created there. We need American know-how. Um, it, it, this, this idea that we have to have a war economy, we have to have a dirty economy, actually, no, we don't. And whether it's transitioning from a dirty economy to a clean economy or from a war economy to a peace economy, there is more return on the investment, not only in terms of money, ultimately, but in terms of our lives by going in the new direction. There are times in history where you simply need to, everyone. You know, when you and I were children, we learned about how evolution works. And we learned that if a species is behaving in a way that is maladaptive for its survival, it will either evolve or it will go extinct. And that evolutionary uh, possibility occurs because somebody creates a mutation of another possibility. That's what the United States should be. We should be the, the mutational possibility of how we could live uh, in a green way on this planet. Over to you, Peter. 
Yeah, thank you. Well said. I think a second critical part of the just transition is to protect working class households, middle class households as we transition away from the fossil fuel economy. So, for example, again, remember, 75, 80 percent of the problem is from fossil fuels. We have to ramp that down. We cannot do that in a way that allows these criminal fossil fuel CEOs to get even richer. So if the price of a gallon of gas spikes and more money goes into the pocket of the CEOs and working class people can't afford gas anymore, guess what's going to happen? First of all, it's injustice on two levels, right? You've got these people who are these amoral people, these basically, in my opinion, criminals, causing the problem getting richer. And then you have working class people who can't afford to get to work anymore because gas is too high. And so they say, screw this policy. We, we want to, you know, so for the policy to work, for the policymakers to stay in office, you have to protect the working class people and make sure that it's a just transition for them too. Not just ethically, but practically speaking, right? You will never. So we saw in France when Macron did a, a gasoline tax, um, the French came out protesting hard, the yellow jackets, and said, no way, like this gas is too expensive. So you have to fund the transition on the backs of the ultra rich, right? So we have a lot of billionaires in this uh, country and somehow taxing them has to be what, uh, and then keeping prices low, maybe some form of rationing for the working class. There has to be incentives. Like, so for example, instead of a gasoline tax, you have to have a fee and dividend uh, where you give the, the money collected back to the working class so they can actually yeah. continue to afford energy costs as we transition. So it's very important to do this in a way that's just, especially for the working class. Um, do you want to say more? Or should I just keep going? Uh, there's a couple more things. So uh, we have to end fossil fuel subsidies. It's insane that we're still subsidizing oh, <laughs> these You're fossil fuel business. corporations. Yeah. We give them billions of dollars. And this is true of pharmaceutical companies and others as well. We give oil companies, guys, that are, first of all, destroying the planet. Second of all, already making billions of dollars in profit. We give them billions of dollars in subsidies. I love the line from Martin yeah. Luther King Jr. If they give it to the poor, they call it a handout. If they give it to the rich, they call it a subsidy. <laughs> You're yeah. right. You uh, the prop Pardon? Right. One of the most one of the most important policies of all, uh, which you and it's very prominent in your plan, which makes me very happy, is uh, no new fossil fuel infrastructure, no new fossil fuel projects of any kind. Because uh, again, if you're if you're still building new pipelines um, and and issuing new drilling permits. Um, then you're still going absolutely in the wrong direction. We have to so run down and not expand. The president has the power to unilaterally stop that, doesn't she? Yes, I think I believe so. Yes, um, I think it needs to come, like I said, in conjunction with policies that protect the working class. Right. So if you just stop new fossil fuel projects and you didn't have you know, a reduction policies designed to reduce energy use, policies designed to ramp up renewable energies, policies designed to tax the rich and make sure the working class could afford energy. If all you did was stop new uh, new projects, then the price of fossil fuels would skyrocket. And again, it would be an unsustainable policy. You basically have- And that would create chaos. It, so it has create... to come in conjunction. Right. right. So that it would needs create... to come as a basket that would create chaos economically yes. it would create chaos in people's lives okay everybody correct so so, so yeah you have to have an interlinking basket of policies basically to ensure that it is in fact a just transition as you said yeah so everyone um, if you look at marianne2024.com you'll see we do have a basket of policies and uh, one of the first things we do and i think it is urgent it is Absolutely. And, and also, by the way, as Peter, I'm sure would agree, uh, cutting the military budget will help because uh, the U.S. military is the single largest institutional emitter of, of greenhouse gases. Correct, Peter? Uh, that's my current understanding. And I will also say that um, the Inflation Reduction Act spends maybe 6% per year what we spend on the military budget to stop climate change. So do we, I mean, is that what the planet's worth to us? Like just 6% well, okay. of the military budget? Yeah, we, we have to look at that term national security because the, the current military budget right. is not exactly. increasing our national security, but the lack of, of um, support given to actually saving the planet in terms of the environment, <laughs> climate change is definitely decreasing our national security and our species security. So, okay, what you have right. here is a campaign that represents an understanding of all these things and a willingness to go in there and make these changes. 
um, these incremental approaches, or in the case of the Biden administration, it's not even incremental approaches. It's actually proactively moving in the wrong direction, but particularly hideously saying that they're not. Um, I don't want to make it personal, but somebody over there certainly knows what they're doing. Right, Peter? Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, this is, so Marianne, this is probably something that you don't really want to hear me say, but I feel just like electoral politics has failed me personally. Um, so um, I'm not sure where we're going right now as a country. But I've been pushing for civil disobedience. I've been pushing to wake up the public so that candidates like you with good climate plans can start winning elections all up and down the ballot. Um, right now, I just feel like, you know, everyone says uh, that there's it's a pretty good majority if you say, like, should climate should stop and climate change be a priority? So you get like, you know, 70 some percentage of all Americans say yes to that. But if you say, like, what's the most important priority for America right now? And you've got the list of the 12 things that is always on that list. Climate change is right down near the bottom. So that's why people aren't they're not that this is the main reason why they're not holding the Biden administration to account right now and that the no. administration could do all these terrible things. Uh, and it's the media too, right? The media is not holding the Biden administration to account. So we have don't to get the public me, Peter. to wake up. Don't, in don't invisibilize me. Don't erase me. I'm here. I'm running. And this is the psychological leap. When you have a candidate running for the Democratic nomination who is saying, I would do these things, I'm not part of that system, there's no reason for me not to, then don't invisibilize it, don't erase it, support it. Every vote for me in the primary, whether I win or whether I don't win, is a vote in the direction of that conversation. So this anti-electoralism that some people are promoting right now, not that I'm saying that you're promoting it, is to me such a, a way that uh, we sometimes shoot ourselves in the foot. I'm not saying that a president who gets this is the be-all and the end-all, but a president who gets this, a president who says that the first day she'll, um, uh, she will cancel the Willow Project, president who agrees with everything that you've been saying is not nothing. So um, it's really difficult for a woman sometimes because we feel sort of like, oh, you might appear conceited or arrogant. But um, you know what? It's too late to worry about any of those things. Um, vote for me and let's make this happen. Well, I will say that, um, you know, I'm glad that you're running in the Democratic primary. You've definitely got my vote there. Um, I you. didn't mean to invisibilize you. I just um, thank you. Uh, it's the whole lesser of two evils things just uh, drives me crazy. And um, that's why I'm focusing. You know, I'm very happy to come on and talk about uh, the science of global heating and some of the policy ideas that I have, maybe possibly naively since I'm not a policy expert. But I think it's all common sense stuff that we were talking about. Um, I do choose to continue to push for a really strong grassroots movement. Um, I, and I wish that more people, in addition to voting, would go out and start doing the same. And by the way, uh, one other policy that I hope you would implement, Marianne, would be protections for climate activists, because around the world right now... Oh, I agree. Laws. We see it with people who are protesting animal factory farming. We see it with what's happening at Stop Cop City. Um, right, exactly. I hope you what, could be, what could be less American? It's so un-American to criminalize protests. It's just a travesty. It's against so. the Constitution. And you know what, Peter? I hope you will consider endorsing me. Your voice is important, and I hope that you will consider endorsing the one candidate who is saying these things. Uh, if you do, I'm very grateful. And if you don't, uh, I'm still a huge fan of yours. I certainly endorse you. And uh, everybody, you can't get uh, a more powerful voice in terms of all these things than Peter Thomas. And you know, one of the things, Peter, that you continue to say is that you're not a policy expert. But we want to be careful with that line because that's one of the mm, ways they point. make us feel like, who am I to weigh in? The people in Washington are policy experts. No, they're not. No, they're not. And they're not even listening Marianne, to policy I'm, experts. And, I'm and glad I'm, you said that. This country, you know, it's the myth of the experts. You've heard the experts enough. The people who have to weigh in now are not just the experts because they don't listen to the experts necessarily. The people who need to weigh in are the people. And yes, you do that at the ballot box. So, hello. 
I'm glad you said that, Marianne, because as I was saying, you know, I'm not a policy expert. I had that same thought and I should stop saying that. And um, I think it is uh, basically common sense stuff. And same thing with the climate science. Um, it's the basics of the science aren't that hard to understand. There's tons of websites. There's tons of places to get good information. Be careful not to get misinformation. So make sure that you're going to a reputable source, but it's not that hard to find them. So once again, say your Twitter and uh, say your website so everybody can know where to find you. So I'm a climate human on Twitter, uh, on TikTok, and on Instagram. And my website is peterkalmus.net. Peter, thank you. And everybody, I know that you uh, feel as I do that we're very fortunate to have Peter's voice. Uh, we learned so much from him. I hope you learned a lot here in this Firelight Chat. And now it's our job to take it from here. I hope that you'll join with me and do that. Let's take it home. Otherwise, we'll be looked back on as a generation. Our grandparents, our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will be thinking, what could they have been thinking? Let's change that scenario so that our great-grandchildren will say, well, they were really something. They pulled it off at the last minute, but they pulled it off. Remember Winston Churchill's line, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've exhausted every other option. We've exhausted every other option. Let's do the right thing. Peter, I Excellent. love you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, Marianne. God bless yeah. you, honey.